Hello, hello and welcome. Um, I am so excited to welcome all of you to today's Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I am the digital editor of Alta Journal and your host and moderator here at today's Alta Live, where we will be discussing Alta's latest serial by Ruby McConnell, the dam that damnable Applegate Road, the other Oregon Trail. It is, is quite possibly one of the most important components of the emigrant trail from the Midwest and East Coast to the West Coast that we haven't talked about nearly enough that I hadn't heard of. So Ruby has written a five-part series for Alta Serial, which you can read at altaonline.com, and many of you probably already have. It is fantastic and eye-opening, and it is the story of the Applegate brothers and their family's trip to Oregon, as well as their quest to find a safer and more manageable route for future travelers. Um, before we begin, I want to do two things, tell you a little bit about our guest and tell you a little bit about Alta, if that works for everyone here. Ruby McConnell is a writer, geologist, environmental activist, and explorer. Her work centers on outdoor advocacy, place, and the examination of the relationships between landscape and the human experience. There's uh, the best way, the best example of that is in her, her current Alta serial. Her work has appeared in scientific journals and outlets, including the Huffington Post, Mother Earth News, Oregon Humanities, Grain Magazine, and Lit Hub, one of our favorites. And she was awarded an Oregon Literary Arts Fellowship in 2016. She is the author of the Outdoor Engagement Series, A Woman's Guide to the Wild, A Girl's Guide to the Wild, My Nature Journal and Activity Book, and Ground Truth, A Geological Survey of Life. Um, which that collection of environmental essays was a finalist for the 2021 Oregon Book Awards and was listed as one of Ms. Magazine's best books of the year. We are so excited for her new book, Wilderness and the American Spirit, which is due out in the spring of next year. Before I dive into my conversation with Ruby, let me tell you about Alta. This is our brand new issue. Alta is an award-winning quarterly journal focused on California in the West. In fact, our new issue right now is it's what you're calling it the gimme shelter issue. We have a huge section inside all about housing, shelter issues in California and the West. Um, but we also, our cover story is on Oppenheimer, the atomic bomb and comparing that with AI. Um, so do check out our brand new issue, which is up right now. We also do events like this, weekly events, Alta Live, monthly California book club. Those things are free. Alta Serials is free. Um, Ruby's just ran with the Applegate Road. We've got another one upcoming from Gary Camilla. So if you, if you haven't checked out Alta's body of work yet and are like this sort of thing, want to learn more, please do visit our website, altaonline.com. There. Later today, you will find a recording of this video, as well as links to Ruby Serial um, and anything else we talk about. So please do check us out. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions for Ruby. We'll chat for about a half an hour and then get to as many of those questions as possible. I see folks checking in with their locations online. Hi, Trinidad, Potomac, Maryland, San Francisco. Someone else is in Pendleton, Oregon. Tracy, hi, everyone. I am like my friend, Lynn Lombardo. I'm in Novato, California. Ruby McConnell, where are you today? Hi, everyone. I am in Eugene, Oregon. I am so grateful for you taking the time to join us today. I reread your the complete Alta serial, all five parts, um, again, over this past weekend and was just as engrossed um, as I was the first time I read it. For those that haven't gotten the chance to read yet, can you give us the, the real Reader's Digest version of who were the Applegate brothers, why and when did they emigrate to Oregon, um, and and what, that, what happened on that journey? Sure, yeah. So the Applegates um, were a trio of brothers that started in St. Louis. They had they had moved to St. Louis to sort of establish themselves and um, they were on the edge of, of the frontier and they got um, sort of enticed out to Oregon country um, in the very first wagon train in 1843 to head west um, following some of the promoters, people like Marcus Whitman, some of the missionaries. And they took um, the Northern route, which is the main route of, um, well, 
I'm in Oregon and from Oregon, so we consider it the main route of immigration <laughs> west, um, that main northern trail. And along the way, um, they got to, when they got to Oregon country, they um, took a river portage on the Columbia River and lost several members of their company, family members, um, a good family friend, two of the brothers sons um, were lost and they sort of they had a series of boats and they sort of had to watch as um, catastrophe kind of you know took these small children um, in the river and when they made it safely finally after that into the Willamette Valley um, they were convinced that there had to be a better way of of getting to Oregon country and and there were they knew that there was this flush of people thousands of people coming behind them and they were involved in um, setting up the territorial government and they they sort of kept it in their minds that there had to be a better way that there needed to be another route and at some point it became important to the United States government to establish another route as well um, for economic and military and expansionist reasons, um, because at that point, Oregon territory was still disputed um, amongst between the United States and colonial powers. And the Applegates, um, Jesse and Lindsay and Charles took advantage of that moment to say, we think we can find this route. We think that we can do it over land. We think we can avoid that awful river. Um, and they did that. They, two of the brothers set out and left their families behind with Charles and found a Southern route through the Siskiyous and um, up over the mountain passes of Southern Oregon and um, brought people out. And it didn't go well the first year. It was the, <laughs> it was the same year that trapped the Donner Party. Um, there was really unexpected weather. And um, in spite of successfully charting the route, the way, because, because people got trapped and people lost their lives and they lost all of their possessions, um, by the time everyone made it to Oregon, they turned on the Applegates and publicly and derided them. And this went on for generations and still kind of goes on today where the Applegates are, family has been caught up in this controversy of, you know, were they grifters? Did they purposefully lead people into danger or were they these like good natured, guys that just had a series of unfortunate events happen. Um, and, and in the meantime, you know, they tried to establish themselves um, in Oregon country and found that that was really troubled and difficult as well. It's a really, um, I think, iconic Western story that got kind of buried because of the controversy. Is that, is that why you think it got buried? I mean, one of the points that you make, and I don't want any spoiler alerts, but this is history, um, but you in in the final part of your series, you you argue that the reason that we haven't heard of the Applegate Trail, that it's not nearly as famous as as other kind of components of the Oregon Trail is because there's no kind of happy ending for the Applegates. There's no light at the end of their American dream tunnel. It all just kind of went wrong and they never managed to dig their way out of it. Right. So, so, I mean, everyone, everyone who came to Oregon country and, and, you know, and to California as well in, in the 1840s and even the 1850s was thought that they were headed towards prosperity. You know, like the, the promoters to Oregon country used to talk about cooked pigs with forks sticking out of them, like running through the forest. So like you would have to, you would do nothing, you know, and, um, and so I think that the, the dream was, especially for the Applegate brothers um, and Jesse Applegate, who, who was very into politics, was that they would, go, they would go and they would have this prosperous land and they would make money and they would um, be a part of government and they would establish themselves as senior states people. And, and while some of those things happened between the hardships that they suffered in the rest of their lives. And then this controversy where in fact, some of the um, family members and descendants of people who were involved in the trail or who got hung up in the trail in part of the dispute, they actively campaigned to have the Applegate name removed from the trail. Um, and there are people who still refuse to, to call it the Applegate trail. There's still, there's still points of contention. If you talk to current descendants current descendants of the Applegates and these other families feel this controversy today acutely. 
This is something that that they actively carry with them, and it and it is a case. You know, there's part of it is that it's in a it's a, in a part of the world that um, never became densely populated. You know, it's it's a major area. It's a major line of transport. The route is incredibly important. It's part of the I-5 um, interstate in Oregon and part of like the major connecting routes um, to the eastern states. And um, in spite of that, if you drive through that country even now in Oregon, there's there's a lot of empty space and um, there's not really a lot of large urban centers. And so um, because of, I think that combination of, of never really, the, you know, the, the people never really got a foothold and the population never really got a foothold. And then there was this controversy that um, it just sort of faded away. But the Applegate name is on streets and rivers right. and all over the place. I saw a question pop up, um, the Applegates settled in Yonkala. Um, originally, which is um, south of Eugene, maybe 45 miles. Um, and also one of the brothers spent some time in the Ashland area. Um, uh, sorry, Tracy, that the Q&A is not working for you. If the Q&A isn't working, folks, just pop them in the chat here and we'll see them. Um, can you, in terms of the controversy that plagued the Applegate family to this day, um, explain exactly the the Applegate family goes with this kind of the wagon train to Oregon. They lose family members along the way. It is awful. That inspires them. As does this kind of seminal moment in history where they can take advantage of government funding to go back east and and find a better route. Um, on that trip, can you tell us exactly what went wrong? Well, <laughs> If I could tell you exactly what went wrong, we wouldn't have the controversy. So that's part of the problem is, is that, you know, everyone was biased, everyone was keeping a diary, everyone was writing letters, um, and there's a lot of things that don't set, um, match up. But what we do know is this. They set out with um, like Hudson's Bay Company maps from like the 1820s. They were following indigenous footpaths for, for part of the way out of like the Salem Eugene area and south. And then when they turned east, they were really sort of just trying to find the best path through the mountains. So the first thing that's important to remember is that when we say road, this is not, it's not really an applicable or true word. This is not a road by any, in any sense that we would um, qualify it as a road. What it really was, was a passage, right? This is a way that a human can actually get over these mountains. And People, so the road hunters were coming from the West and they were kind of doing this on foot with their provisions. And then they get to Fort Hall and they're like, hey, come take our road. And these are like families with children and like antiques and furniture. And they were already late in the season. And, the, um, and that had nothing to do with the Applegates, right? And that had nothing to do with the road hunters that they were starting late in the season. And that was always a really tre tre um, treacherous thing to do as we know the Cascades um, the weather can be quite unpredictable. We got snow in the Cascades um, last week, I think, in the last couple of weeks, really late in the season. Well, you um, mentioned also that, like, as they were as they were coming east, some riverbeds were totally dry, and so then when it was time for the people to use that road back west, the river was suddenly raging. Right. So all of a sudden, the, the weather turns, and it turns into like you know the whole world is a muddy quagmire. And there's debris everywhere. So like it wasn't passable for wagons. There was part of, so because it was so late in the season, some of these guys on this road hunting team, there was about 15 of them. They had obligations back at home with their families. They had harvests to bring in. They had to make sure that they were taken care of for winter. Um, so, you know, communication being what it was in the 1800s, you know, you go on ahead and tell the people that their trail is ready. I'll make sure that it's ready maybe what your definition of ready is, is not the same as somebody else's definition of ready. Um, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with how prepared, you know, when the Applegates came out, um, you know, these guys were farmers, they worked on boats, they, you know, some of, you know, one of the brothers was a blacksmith, they had um, like a skill set but a lot of the subsequent wagon trains, these were sort of, you know, moneyed, 
people, maybe a little bit more genteel business people who didn't necessarily have, um, you know, like they weren't surveyors, they weren't able to navigate, they maybe, um, you know, were a little bit rounder in the belly and they were less prepared um, sure. for all of this. And, and I think it really made it um, challenging when you put the the bad circumstances of the weather and the late start, they also had um, some troubling encounters with the indigenous population who at that Tell point had figured that. out that there was a big influx of people and that was becoming problematic. Um, and, and it all sort of fell apart very quickly. You mentioned um, that there was, you call it justified harassment from the indigenous people in the area, in the various areas that they were passing through. What did that entail? Um, well, I think, I think that there was, um, you know, there was a lot of sort of stealing of cattle, stealing of possessions. Um, I think that there was a lot of sort of violent nighttime raids or close calls. Um, who starts those and and how that plays out is really poorly recorded. I think I think it's really important at this point that I mention that Americans and the United States um, has really places a high value on property rights, on individual property rights, on our ability to defend our property and our property rights, and also on um, our right to bear arms and to use those, um, that right to bear arms, to defend our lives, our property, um, and especially to defend those things from um, aggressive foreign powers. <laughs> so I would say that by our own legal and um, value our own legal standards and our own expressed value system as a country, if we applied that to the, the plight of the indigenous people at that time, we would have to define it as justified harassment or a justified response as these people were of course yeah. defending their property yeah. um, from, from a foreign power, you know, that they saw as aggressive. And, and I think that, um, oh, I know that, that the encounters that people had on those in those first couple of years on the Applegate Trail became an ongoing, um, really, really um, bloody and violent um, war with the particularly the Modoc Indians and collectively all of the um, indigenous people in the Rogue River area um, that I think um, to this day has really defined um, that that area to a large extent. So when I say that it was justified, I think that it's not only justified, but also still um, part of what the unresolved history in this story is. Sure. Um, Tracy asks again, let's just clarify when exactly this took place. In 1843 was when the Applegates first came out. And then there was, there was actually, they, they had tried they made more than one attempt over a series of years in the 1840s to try to find this road. Um, it was very well publicized. They would, you know, Jesse was already a part of the territorial government and they, you know, they were, they sort of were, you know, talking about it in the paper, the road hunters are going to, you know, create this road and the military will be able to come and we'll be able to get supplies and we won't have to take ships. And it was, it was the key supposedly the key to sort of connecting that part of Oregon territory to the, the moneyed California country down below. And so as these people are coming back from the, I guess the Applegate Trail kind of starts ends in Idaho, as the, the emigrants who are taking this new route move westward, they get stuck. They get mired in the, the awful kind of weather the huge the roads aren't big enough they're not as as roady as they had hoped um how long were they stranded i mean people were trapped a la yeah, for Donner weeks Party. and weeks weeks and weeks and um long enough that that there was time for news that people were stranded to make it into the Willamette yeah. Valley and for people to then head out and meet them for rescues, you know, so, so probably on the order of months. And, it, you know, 
stuck versus, I mean, there were days that they made that they talk in their journals about like, well, we made it like a mile. <laughs> a day. So, you know, like, is that stuck? Is that progress? Um, what does that do to, um, you know, like the, the mindset of, of the people, which I think at that point, you know, was um, really pretty desperate. Like you start to really run low on not just supplies, but on um, hope and also goodwill. Um, you know, like you're traveling often with people that you had never met before. Right. You're following, you know, people that, you know, picked you up in Idaho and are like, come follow me. So, you know, so it's, you may not have a lot of faith in whoever your, your leadership is. Um, a lot of people were sick. I think that, that it just, everything begins to compound. And then with the difficulty of the passage and the difficulty of the terrain, um, people just really suffered. It's so interesting that this happened the same years as the Donner Party. Um, mm -hmm. That same kind of fall, winter, 1848, 49 as the Donner Party. They got bad directions like the Donner Party got from Hastings. They, you know, take the shortcut and it'll be better and safer and you'll get there a month earlier. This wasn't necessarily a shortcut, but this was the you won't die cut. Um, and yet it's nowhere near as famous as the Donner Party. I mean, presumably there wasn't cannibalism in the, <laughs> seriously, in the, on the Applegate Trail, people that were stranded. They, they And they weren't snowed in, presumably. I mean, it was a survivable stranding. I, I think it was a survivable right stranding. I mean, people did die on the order of, of dozens. Um, one of the members of the company, um, Jesse Quinn Thornton actually started out with the Donner Party. Um, and he <laughs> he started out with the Donner Party and he couldn't um, he couldn't like keep it together with them. He couldn't get along with them. He, and he's he's like people in, in historical documents, he's described as like constant complaining and irascible and like this kind of like really irascible. Love that. Yeah. Word. Like they just they use all of these great words to describe him. And um and he's actually, it's, I'm quoting him. He's the one who called it that damnable Applegate Road. He's the one who complained. It couldn't stop. I mean. He's the know, one that couldn't stop. Justifiably he, so. He wrote, he wrote to like, I mean, he got back and um, he, he made it to Oregon country um, before the Donners made it out of Donner Pass and was so upset. I mean, he itemized every item that he lost. You know, there's a list of every, you know, like I lost the clock, we lost like the dishes, all of this, you know, my wife suffered. And then he took to the newspapers and just kept writing and kept calling out the Applegates and calling them names and saying that they were awful people. At one point he um, challenged them to a duel, to a public duel really? over this. Wait, all three brothers? I think, I think it was Jesse because Jesse was the politician and um, Thornton, he became a, a quite well-known Oregon politician. He um, gifted Oregon, the Oregon's motto, something along the lines of she, she, she flies on her own wings or something. I don't have that memorized. Someone, if you but... know Oregon's motto, please pop it in the chat. I love a motto. <laughs> oh my God. He challenged them to a duel though. I'm still yeah. on that. Whoa. But, but Jesse had, had already because he was part of the territorial government, like at, like completely unrelated to that, he had already pushed a bill through the territorial government banning public dueling. So that ended up working out in his favor because <laughs> they had like sorted that piece out. But then like, you know, like he, he had friends that then took to the newspapers to defend his name. Um, you have to remember that this was, I mean, in the 1840s, the newspapers were like, Facebook or TikTok, you know, or Twitter, closer to Twitter. She flies with her own wings. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> um, she flies with her own wings at the Oregon motto. Um, and, and so, I mean, in, in old papers from, from that time, I mean, they, they would list who went to tea at someone's house for the afternoon. 
they, you know, and they were still, you know, like, you know, it would be many, many, many decades before they would stop, you know, ringing the bells, the church bells every time someone died. Like people, this was not, um, you may have been isolated and you may have been away from family, but you didn't necessarily have privacy. And, and the newspapers were, were the social media of the time. It wasn't, it wasn't just journalism. It was the way that you communicated and it was the comments section as well. Well, I love that. I mean, it's, it's so fascinating. Whatever happened to, I want to get to, I want to kind of end with the, you know, what happened to the Applegate brothers, but what happened to Thornton? Did he ever get over it? Did he find some kind of closure? <laughs> he, I mean, he, he, if the two, the following the Donner Party or the Applegate brothers, I mean, he made the right call. He, he ended up in the most survivable of two kind of doomed journeys. Yeah, he never forgave the Applegates. I mean, he he lived a long, successful life. He made his way through Oregon politics. You know, he he had a good life, um, but he just he never forgave them for for that experience, and and, so, and was sort of convinced that it might have been deliberate. You know, but it, I mean, he, I I think that you talk about in the serial as you met with the Applegates, they the Applegate descendants, present day kind of the descendants of. Charles, Jesse, and Lindsay, um, they maintained their intentions were good. Their intentions were sincere and righteous and that they were trying to, they had lost their children in this very dangerous journey and they were trying to find a safer way for other families. Do you believe that to be true? I, I do believe that. I believe that for a couple of reasons, um, not the least of which is that, um, you know, Jesse was a surveyor, Lindsay was a scout, um, they, they had a skill set around this previously. They, um, you know, like they, the stakes were high because Jesse was already a part of the government and um, he, he knew that, that he would be held to account um, and, and that the previous failure of the previous group um, was something that made it into the papers. I mean, this, this, was, this was, you know, a really big deal and there was a lot of eyes on this and this was, this was high stakes. Um, and also there's, they lost their own children, um, but there's also a lot of evidence th that they had an internal moral compass. Um, they, they made a lot of efforts in post sort of setting up their homesteads um, to, to try and like live um, really peaceably with the indigenous population at a time when that was not the prevailing attitude or um, way of being. They had left St. Louis originally um, in part because of their objections um, to slavery and the, the, their neighbors owning slaves and that they, they found that to be intolerable to continue to, to live there. Um, when they lost their own children, um, on the Columbia River, their 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 first instinct was also to lash out at like the indigenous population um, near the Dalles that had gathered there. And when they got more information about what happened, they they were able to acknowledge that that was you know that their that their first instinct was wrong and to change that narrative. And they've and then they've worked really hard generationally to to acknowledge that yes, this was the first instinct and, and that was an incorrect instinct. And to be really clear that that was a mistake that they made and that family has carried that forward. Um, my sense is that the Applegates um, were imperfect people like anyone else. And that um, the, I think it's more of a testament to the enormity of the task than anything else. Um, I think that what they were being asked to do and what people were taking on in coming West this way um, was a barely survivable, survivable venture. Um, that, and, and I think that when you barely survive something and you've been told that this will be easy and you're coming to a land of plenty, um, you look for somewhere to place blame. Sure. And we, we don't hear a lot from the ladies of the Applegate family. 
Um, and I suspect, tell me if I'm wrong, that the women's voices didn't really count as much and weren't recorded as much in the 1840s and up until today. Um, but also, you know, I these women had a, a dozen at least children each, um, many of whom didn't survive. And then they get left at home um, with Charles. So one brother stayed home while the other two went to find a, a, a better route. Um, is Are there any kind of recorded thoughts, feelings, opinions from the Applegate women? Um, there are. There, and there are, let me say that women on the Oregon Trail in general were as prolific, um, perhaps, as men. They were letter writers. They were diary writers. They were storytellers um, to their descendants. So they, they kept um, a really vibrant oral history. Um, and much like Ginger Rogers did everything backwards and in high heels, um, the women who emigrated West did so breastfeeding and pregnant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and in, in woolen skirts and um, high necked, you know, uncomfortable clothing. Um, and then, yeah, they often, you know, came and found a homestead and had um, their husbands leave and ended up, um, you know, having enough children that you're running a, a one room schoolhouse, but you are also running a homestead, you are providing for an entire family. And I, I think it's not so much that women's voices weren't, um, and work wasn't important or recorded, it's that, um, those letters and diaries were not publicized and republished in modern times um, to the extent that we have celebrated, venerated, and republished male voices since that time. Well, I know an author and historian who could change that for <laughs> um, So kind of to, to wrap it up, can you tell us um, and, and we've got a question here that kind of asks that what the, the Applegate Trail today, where is it? What is there now? How is it? Is it used? You mentioned that it's incredibly important to commerce and travel in the region. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So the Applegate Trail, um, the original Applegate Trail followed, you know, so you start from Salem, which is the capital of Oregon. It's in the center of the state, western portion of the state. And the Applegate Trail um, basically follows the course of Highway 99, which parallels and sometimes converges with um, I-5. Um, oh, I want to say 200 miles south to about... Um, the Grants Pass area where it veers east and becomes a part of, oh, I want to say hey, Highway 220 something. It's the highway that, that I'm, someone out there is like, no, um, it's the highway that takes you out towards White City um, and follows up through the Siskiyous sort of out towards Lakeview and then splits off into Northern Nevada um, and then off into Fort Hall. And so those are, the Applegate Trail now is still sort of the major highways um, running through Oregon. You can, you can still find it. There are historical markers. There's a group of people who have put like railroad ties um, with placards on them that, that mark different spots and each, each place that they've marked has a, a quote on the placard from a diary or a letter that describes the person's experience in that location. There are still oh, wow. areas where you can go see wagon ruts, particularly out by the Humboldt Sink, um, which is sort of, that was like the divergence where people sort of chose to go either south to California or north to Oregon. And that's considered sort of the official trail, um, beginning of the Applegate Trail. Um, but there are places still in Southern Oregon outside Roseburg where you can go and see the original wagon ruts, which I have done and it was fascinating and wonderful. Um, and a or really an interesting- Applegate Trail Museum or so if, if you really wanna go on a no. trail trip. There is, there are a series of informational kiosks in various states of repair and disrepair. Some of them are in um, county parks. There's one in, uh, I think it's Avery Park in the city of Corvallis has one. There's um, an informational kiosk in a county park outside Veneta, Oregon. Um, there is an informational kiosk outside the city of Rogue River. 
um, which is outside Grants, so about eight miles south of um, Grants Pass. And um, no, the the lack of the lack of a dedicated Applegate building museum something I think is is um, indicative of sort of how buried this story sure. got. Is there any mention, and I, I must ask this, much to the chagrin of my coworkers who are mocking me for my love of the Oregon Trail video game. <laughs> From both of our childhood, we are the same age. And I think that if you went to elementary school in the 1980s, you played Oregon Trail. Um, there's no mention of the Applegate Trail. I mean, what you no. say, as you've been saying these things, I'm like the Dells, like, oh, that's a stop on the video game, the Oregon Trails. I mean, much of how I learned about in, in, in concert with the history classes was through the Oregon Trail playing the game and making all of the stops. Um, but there's no mention of the Applegate Trail, I think, in the Oregon Trail. I, I had never heard of it. I mean, I, I grew up in Oregon um, in the 80s and they, you, it's Lewis and Clark and Oregon Trail all day long. You know, I mean, you think that everybody did it and, um, and it, you don't hear about it. You, I mean, I, I found out about the Applegate Trail because I kept seeing signs that um, either pointed, you know, they were like informational kiosk this way, or um, it would say the California Applegate Trail. And finally I was, I was what is this? <laughs> <laughs> and and I started following the signs and sort of went down a rabbit hole. I have a really wonderful husband who turns off the main road when I say turn off the main road. <laughs> that's a that's a wonderful um marrying a nerd has served me well also. You get to be like, yeah. oh, stop here. Um well look where it's led you. I, I'm so glad and I'm I'm so um Thank you for writing the serial for Alta because it was so much fun to read and I know our, our audience loved it. If you haven't yet read it, do not fear. We will send you a link to that as well as a link um, to this video with this interview, which has been recorded um, and to, to Ruby's work. I hope you check out more from her. Join us next week at Alta Live. Doug Peacock is going to join us. The famed naturalist and writer Doug Peacock will join us to discuss his, his proposal that we drain Lake Powell um, and use it to fill up, help replenish the Colorado River. So um, do join us for that. That is next week, July 5th, um, here at Alta Live. Ruby, so much fun to get to know you and talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone for coming. We appreciate it. Thanks everyone. Take care.